That's us. We're live. What's up, everybody? Hey. I am here with Mike Morris, the one and only, the legend, the story artist, the amazing illustrator. And of course, today he is our special guest on Adobe Live. So thanks for joining us, everybody, from wherever you are. Let us know where you are in the chat. Okay. Franck is here in the room with us. You all know and love Franck. And Franck is going to be monitoring the chat. So please tell us if you're watching from Zimbabwe, if you're watching from Tasmania, wherever it is, let us know. And uh, we'd love to know where you're tuning in from. Um, yes, we're in Paris today, uh, but I am not speaking French today. Dommage. Et je suis désolé pour tous les gens qui ont... Uh, <laughs> we were waiting for me to speak French. Not today. Um, today, we're going to speak good old English. It might be too late. I think you just did. I did a tiny bit, but you know what? That's <laughs> kind of going to be the end of that. Um, and we're going to welcome Mike with uh, a very nice warm Adobe. Welcome to the Paris offices. Mike is, by the way, right in the middle of working on an amazing project. And he's very kind to come in here and spend a little time talking about what he does. And we'll do a little demo. We're going to draw together. But really, it's going to be about uh, Mike talking about, I think, this um, this job that a lot of people maybe have heard of but don't fully understand. And I'm one of those people, mm -hmm. story art. So Mike, would you mind please introducing yourself? Tell us who you are and what it is you do. Well, I'm Mike Morris. Uh, I've been in the animation industry for about 16 years. I started in 2006 after graduating from CalArts. I went and worked on uh, a show called The Simpsons. Uh, was, the Simpsons? Yeah, this obscure show that um, nobody's <laughs> ever heard of. Um, but uh, that was an amazing experience because I, I, that was like it was like going to a different kind of school again, you know. Mm -hmm. And and they they have such an incredible way of of uh, making that show. Yeah. And such an incredible, um, you know, ethos and, and, and just a, a good environment for artists. So it's a positive work. It was a very positive working mm -hmm. environment and uh, very close with still a lot of some of those people today. Nice. Um, but that's but amazing yeah, so, that you went from school to The Simpsons. That's a great jump. Well, they they were hiring at the time when Fantastic. no one else was hired. Amazing. They were doing the uh, when the Simpsons movie was happening. Oh, OK. I so they that. were recruiting yeah. for the show. Uh, it was funny because when I got there. Um, it was like, you, you remember to see those cartoons where there's like a gopher invading a garden yes. and then all of a sudden the, you know, the, the vegetables are being pulled underground. Yep. Yeah. That was like the Simpsons movie was the gopher <laughs> pulling all the artists from the, from the upper floors into the movie. Interesting. Because there was a lot of stuff going on in the movie. It was very complicated. And so they, they needed extra resources and they yeah. pulled from within the company that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so then the show was like, Hey, we're running out of people. The movie's yeah. taking all of our people. Yeah. And so they went on a hiring spree and I was uh, fortunate enough to get in on that wave. And uh, I, I'm going to stop you there because I've seen a lot. I've heard and seen a lot of people say I was fortunate enough. Yes, you were fortunate enough, but that means you also had the skills to pay the bills because they're not going to just hire anybody to work true. on The Simpsons. So congratulations for Thank already you. at that being at that level while you were getting out of school that you could draw your butt off, I guess, if they were going to hire you. It was it was a really great experience and uh, a lot of really great people on that show. Yeah. That that know a couple of things about telling a joke on film. I would imagine so. And that's it's not an easy task, you know, um, especially when you kind of doubt the process. Because there's certain you know you'll see the same joke over and over and over and over and over again. Right. right. And sometimes it's still funny, and that's great when it is. But sometimes you're just like, is it funny anymore? Because you're too close to it. <laughs> yeah. You know. And then you show it to somebody else, and they laugh. You're like, okay, I'm all right. I'm all right. Like, the three, I'm doing the three right. Stooges did okay with with poking each other in the eyes four thousand times. People still laughed on the four thousandth. It's true. <laughs> it's true. But we're both wearing glasses, so that's not going to work for us. Oh, uh, that's right. We've so got our defense protection. Right. Wear your wear your eye protection. That's right. You were talking about humor. I just want to. I don't want to take us too far off track because we're going to talk about where you are now and what you're doing now. But part of what you do, I think, with this visual communication, if you are doing story mm -hmm. art, how much can you inject into just one single illustration? If you really know what you're doing, you can communicate humor and mood and mm -hmm. emotion and all these things if you, you know how to pare down what you're doing to the essentials. I think that's probably one of the things that's necessary for a story artist. Yeah. You know, I think that storytelling boils down to um, a very artful form of communication. Mm-hmm. So like the difference between reading, um, you know, a manual for uh, how to operate a microwave versus, a, you know, fine poetry. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, both are communicative. Right. But one is communicative in a more artful way. And I think that's what story storytelling in and of itself is. I like this you analogy. Know? Yeah. Um, because you're you're saying something in a way that has uh, a, a clear idea of getting, you know, from one brain to another, because obviously we're not uh, up to the point yet 
we're evolved to brain to brain communication. And so we have to set forth ideas in a visual communication yeah. or in an auditory or in written form. And so um, those who can communicate in a way that is not only uh, like illustrative of the point, but also uh, aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. That's what I feel like good storytelling is, especially yeah. when you're doing story art. It sounds like you're talking about something that's more important even outside of the world of entertainment. Yeah. To actually human communication in yeah. general, being able to communicate not only mm -hmm. effectively, but kind of beautifully and with a little bit of flair. This is kind of yeah. important. Well, you know, you always have that friend who's a really great storyteller, right? Mm -hmm. Who's like, you're going to wonder what that guy did on the weekend because he's going to tell you and it's going to be amazing. And right? all I did was go to Target and buy some socks because he's going to make it into a great story. That's, and that's an art. A, Yeah. And that's when that's when that guy saw somebody else mm -hmm. who did an amazing thing. Yeah. Like uh, uh, my my uh, my brother uh, told me a story one time about somebody who he saw shoplifting. Oh, wow. And this, uh, this larger woman was trying to smuggle uh, two hams under her dress. No way. Yeah. And then um, all of a sudden she, she sort of lost her grip on something and uh, the hams fell out from underneath her dress. <laughs> and she looks around frantically and said, who threw those hams at me? <laughs> and uh, I was like, should we draw you that? You can't That's make funny. that stuff off. <laughs> <laughs> and how clever. What a, what a great way to like segue out of that. It's yeah, like, yeah. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm, I'm <laughs> completely threw innocent. those hams at me? <laughs> you know what? She should get a little prize for inventiveness there. That's pretty good. I would have bought the, the hams spot, before. <laughs> that's some good spontaneous thinking right there. <laughs> I would have said, ma'am, please allow me to buy your ham for you <laughs> because that was clever. <laughs> yeah. Well done her. Bravo. Yeah. She gets the Emmy. Yeah. All right. So you went from The Simpsons and did that for, you said, just two years? and then uh, we're Almost already... nine. Oh, you were there for a long time. Yeah, I was there for a, a good period of time. And then I went to uh, Disney Feature Animation for an internship uh, during <gasps> Princess and the Frog. Simpsons, Disney. Good so, gracious. and then uh, after that, I went to uh, Disney Television Animation yeah. and worked on some projects there. All um, story art along the way, right? This was story yes. art, sometimes other yes. things. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, um, I went on to DuckTales. Oh, right. Because, uh, yeah, <laughs> Every day there are um, I had a, a, a friend of mine was running that show, mm -hmm. a really fantastic uh, artist. And um, he brought me on, thank thankfully, and I was able to work on that show through uh, one through three, all three seasons. Nice. And then, um, well, par partially the first and the third. Um, and then uh, I was able to do a lot on that show, uh, yeah. not only story art. And uh, revision work, but also uh, animation revisions as well. Wow, cool. So I am like, I started out as an animator doing um, character layout on The Simpsons and oh. then transitioned and segued into story art. So tell us the difference between those two things. And I know that a lot of people watching will want to know what these categories mean or these, yeah. these what is this, 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 these, these descriptors? Well, character layout is kind of a dying art, unfortunately. Mm. Because um, it, it all stems from when uh, outsourcing started becoming a thing, right? Yeah. Because in the in the you know twenties through the the forties, sixties, and into the seventies, everything was done in the United States mm -hmm. as far as you know Burbank Hollywood studios, and so um, then they started you know the budget started shrinking and, and and producers were expecting more and more, and so you see things like uh, the limited style of the Flintstones, right? Yeah. Where they're taking Hanna -Barbera, right? yeah Hanna Barbera, yeah. Mm -hmm. and they uh, but. Uh, so they started doing what was called limited animation yeah. where they would have something that held for a while and then only the mouth would move or only an arm would go. Yeah, I saw and that in Scooby-Doo and everything yeah, all the time. And all the time. These repeat backgrounds <laughs> this, like, running past the same tree 400 times. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, okay. You know, and, and using a lot of stock footage uh, where they would have uh, like uh, like He-Man was one of the ones that had oh, a lot yeah, of stock footage. Same backgrounds all the time. Yeah. yeah same. And also even they reuse the same Mm -hmm. uh, animations for the hero characters. Yeah, whenever he transformed from Prince Adam to He-Man, yeah. it was no matter where he was in any world, he was all of a sudden in front of Castle Grayskull right. doing his thing. <laughs> and then, you know, pointing his uh, his uh, so power sword at, you know, Cringer and becomes Battle Cat. And right. So they were using a lot of clips and stuff in, in shows to sort of minimize the uh, financial burden. Yeah. But then you had studios that like uh, Disney Feature who kept going with the traditional way of doing full hand-drawn animation yeah and uh you know i was fortunate enough to to work on princess and the frog a little bit uh a, a few scenes and uh 
do some of that. And it was in incredible to, to be able to work on those. We were, know, we were on paper too, which I was, was going to say, I don't know if people know the amount of work it takes to animate literally two seconds of a scene. Yeah, 48 drawings at least. And that's 48. Well, you're talking about the finished drawings, but you still have to do the sketches. You yeah. still have to do, and then you have to do revisions and you have to, I mean, that's. Well, two seconds, if you got 24 frames per second. Yeah. If you, you can, if you have a, you know, fairly slow movement, you don't have to be super smooth. You can actually get away with 12 frames a second. Okay. By exposing each drawing twice. Right. Right. So I guess the bare minimum will be 24 drawings for the four, for, or for the two seconds. Yeah. But these aren't drawings of just a circle. These no. are really great drawings. Every single yeah. frame is a, is a beautiful drawing. It's a, it's a exercise in patience quite often. Mm -hmm. But um, it's very rewarding once you see it working. It is, you and know. I think part of what we appreciate when we watch it is knowing what goes into it, and that human mm. effort is really something to admire. You know, we, you you look at uh, um, a Klaus from Sergio Pablo's animation, mm -hmm. and how uh, a lot of the modern masters uh, were like, "Yeah, I'm going to work on that film." And and Sergio, who was from Disney, ah, I didn't know. Um, that. Yeah, he worked on uh, like Treasure Planet. It was his big breakout with Doctor Doppler. Right, nice. and uh, Brad Pitt did the voice, I think. Yeah. I don't remember. Who treasure did Planet. Before. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think it was a different character. Sorry, but um, yeah, so he started his own in Spain, and that's where Klaus came from. I didn't know that. And uh, they had all kinds of new processes that they had, had invented for that film. If you haven't seen Klaus, by the way, folks, Beautiful. if you're a fan of animation at all, please watch it. It's just a quality, quality piece of art. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, you just like heartwarming stories. Because it's you know it's it's about a a, a a guy who starts out being very narcissistic and selfish, mm -hmm. and he learns about what compassion means, and he learns about you know how to be a good person, mm -hmm. you know, and and it's it's just a really inspiring film. So when you're drawing, and we're yeah. going to folks, don't worry, we're going to get to some drawing, but I want to talk about this part of what you just said, understanding what's really at the root of a story and at the and uh, how a character is going to be changing throughout a story what is their their sort of path of evolution or story arc right the story arc thank you mm -hmm. um that must all be in the back of your mind when you're going through the process of creating the story art right if you're conscientious about it mm -hmm. you know i think a lot of times um we run the risk of artists as becoming technicians mm -hmm. right and so we we get into this mode where we need to just get a job done and then we kind of go on this rote I know I'm going through the motions kind of thing. Yeah. But I think it's really important to understand, uh, and I'm going to be speaking at, at IAMAG, uh, yeah. master classes, uh, uh, tomorrow. Gosh, well, tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow and then um, Saturday and Sunday, so three days in mm -hmm. Paris. I think it's too late to get tickets. I don't know, Frank, are we done with the tickets? There's only one ticket left. There's one ticket left. But folks, just yeah. so you know, those of you who are watching right now on Adobe Live here on YouTube, we're going to be giving away one physical pass for the event and one online pass. Yep. And the online pass will not only get you to watch the online sessions, but you'll also get full access to the IAMAG master classes for a full yes. year. This is a massive, massive prize. So we'll talk to you about that in just a little while. So sorry to interrupt. So you're going to be speaking tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, t speaking about story, mm -hmm. in fact. Excellent. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about that because, uh, I, I really think that story art is, uh, you know, it's a bit, like I said, it's a very conscientious thing. Yeah. You know, you have to understand not only what, what a character is going to be doing, what his physical action is, but how he's doing it and how he does it is affected by why he's doing it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, or, or she or it mm -hmm. or whatever the character may be. Like, um, the character could be the Pixar lamp. It very well could be. Yeah, it could be an inanimate object that's animated. And right. And in, in, in Luxo Jr., mm -hmm. uh, that film, uh, you can see that he is uh, absolutely enamored by a ball. Yeah. And it's just a lamp. Yeah. You know? To and infuse that with personality and yeah. motive. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It is It is really, really neat. Mm -hmm. And um, I think a lot of times, you know, that's the stuff that you... If you're going to be a, re a really good story artist, you have to understand a little bit about what makes uh, something entertaining, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of entertainment, um, I thought we'd challenge ourselves today. Okay, let's do it. To have a little scene that we would try and illustrate over the course of a few, um, the span of a few panels maybe. 
and see how you would handle the story. Okay. Um, so you're here in Paris. And uh, how long, when did you get here? Uh, I got here uh, Wednesday. Okay, Wednesday. Wow. We, we you mean yesterday. No, so not a week ago Wednesday. No, not a week ago. Literally, Literally yesterday. yesterday. Okay, so we, you we were landed experiencing yesterday. a bit of jet lag. Um, sure. Sure, yeah. okay. Yeah. All right. I've totally you not for been water, up not super coffee? late. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> every night working on a film. <laughs> so how? What if we had a? What if we had a character who's never seen the um, Eiffel Tower but is really excited about seeing it, and uh, maybe the character has just um, arrived and they're looking for it but can't find it and they're feeling really dejected, uh -huh. and it's just right around the corner from them, and so they they take one more step further after feeling like right. so things are bad. They're like, where am I going to find this thing? They're feeling badly, but then they take a couple more steps and then suddenly there it is. Would that be something good or can we can we add to that? I, I think that we can totally do that, but I have one cap one request. Please. Is that this person has a yellow sweater. Okay, so our character yeah. has a yellow sweater. Has a yellow sweater. I see a yellow sweater over there. Yeah. Well, we had that very experience. <laughs> Did today, you? No, fact. you're kidding me. No, no, no. You're that kidding. was funny that you said that because I, I thought you had been <sighs> spying on us or something. We, <gasps> no. We had that very, very uh, similar situation today. I think it's a common thing in Paris because you get sort of, you're in all, there's, you can see yeah. it from so many different places, but you have to have the right opening yeah. between certain buildings or trees. And then all of a sudden, oh. Well, there's those museums just, just re uh, to local to here. Right. And uh, we walked around the corner and, Oh, there it was. Oh, and fantastic. Okay, there you go. So so that's a very, very close to home at the moment. All right. Well, do, would you like to try and do something like that? Now, of course, we we don't want to be drawing like a bunch of complex architecture, but I'm curious to see how you would handle this and how you would... And what? how many frames do you think we need? And I, uh, This is all your I don't know. Domain, you know, I, don't know. Just, I think we should just start and see how it goes. Okay. So um, generally what I would probably do is, you know, you have your panel um, and that's... That's fine, but I think um, a good opening is kind of where you want to do um, something like an establishing shot. Right? Okay, okay. So I think, you know, we could have uh, a... Uh, I think a good place to start would be in a subway terminal. Oh, that's great. So you would have some sort of uh, banister going down here mm -hmm. and then also that would connect to a larger metro station type opening um, or some sort of covering um, you know uh, oftentimes there's a little sign or whatever and you know this is a vast generalization no, of what, of what these this. really it's look like, like to be able to think this in these simple folks I just want to well, and while well, I I'm gonna interrupt a lot I apologize but this is important no, I fine. think for people who are aspiring to understand how to draw better, to understand how to use simple primitives. So, you know, um, triangles, uh, rectangles, circles, things like that, um, and to turn those in perspective. So you notice that Mike, right off the bat, is using this three-quarter view perspective. He's automatically in the back of his mind thinking about a horizon line and vanishing points and things like that, but it's just happening naturally. He's envisioning the scene from a certain angle, think about camera angle, but it's mostly, it's just simple primitives. It's a few straight lines, it's a few forms that have been turned in space, and there's no real detail there other than what's necessary to communicate where we are and what these forms are, what these structures are. And this is, mm -hmm. this is just fundamentally good drawing. So I, I think it's important to call that out. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, you know, and, and a lot of times you just don't have the time to do really detailed drawings. So you, you, you do what, you need to do to get by. And, you know, oftentimes too, we can just grab these uh, same things. And um, I think it's uh, with an alt that you just drag yeah, it on over. There you go. And then you can do the same thing with uh, this. Ah, yep. Yeah. And then your character pops up. And then the character, and, you know, oftentimes too, we can we can change it and we'll, we'll give it a little bit of a pan. So I'm going to uh, do a selection here. Can you tell people what a pan is? Because that's, so it's, it's uh, this, camera is, this is, you know, the vernacular in the business that camera movement. Okay. So, um, you know, there's <clears> going to be a moving camera in, in pretty much uh, most of the things that you do. And um, in this case, we can do just a little extension on the end of this one. Um, so we'll just give it a little 
extra oh, e deselect I think um, just give a little extra and then we'll put some arrows right here to show the camera is moving from there to here and we have uh, you know this uh, this person uh, yes coming up uh, you know I, it doesn't have to be like super uh detailed or anything just just yeah. enough uh the character and maybe uh um, holding a map uh you know i, I think having a oh great yes already you know, See, just sort of just sort of stepping out of of um the uh, uh the escalator yeah that's the word i'm looking for and then you can put a little uh, arrow on top saying like this is you know where this person is going and but and it's then, so great. You're you're telling a story immediately because of the map. That prop is saying to us they're looking for something or at least trying to find their way. This is such yeah. a great yeah. And then um, you know, you can go back to and, and I'm not gonna go back to the layer upon layer upon layer. I'm just gonna just start drawing and go from there. I think we can dispense with the pleasantries of layers. Sure, um, sure. Um I think we can go to uh, what we would generally call a cut in. Right? Okay. So a cut in is taking the same staging generally and going from a wide shot into a smaller shot. Okay. And so that you would say that this this character would um you know be kind of walking walking in with uh the map and uh you know really excited about you know being here and uh you know holding holding this this map and walking into frame. A little bit more and you know sometimes all you need is just a little bit of something to give it a sense of place so this uh you know pillars or something behind mm. here with like maybe like a museum door or something like that so something behind there to say this is a place where this person is currently excellent because we see a lot of things like uh um just blank backgrounds and that's fine if it's just you Mm -hmm. But again, we're communicating from our thoughts and imagination to someone else's, you know, intelligence. Right. And so, you know, giving them somewhere to sort of something to hang the hat on, essentially, I think is a, is a good uh, a good way to go. So, you know, looks up from the map. It's really excited about, you know, being there and seeing everything. Maybe, you know, a little arrow saying to drop the map and. You know, let's uh, get a, that nice yellow um, sweater. So these arrows are on. great because they're they're the cue saying this is just moved. This object has moved, but you're also using the arrows to show camera direct or movement of camera. So you're using in, in addition to the drawings, obviously you're you have these little symbols that you mm -hmm. use to indicate movement of different kinds. Yeah, and, and, and that's standard practice, standard language. For 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 th this is would be considered thumbnail drawings, mm -hmm. right? So these are really really non uh, labored yeah. things because often so so often so story story art is very disposable, right? And it's designed to be disposable, right? It's not precious. Yeah, so you shouldn't be precious with anything, and even even when you've gone through a bunch of work, and uh, you know you put a lot of effort into something, still not precious. Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard uh, stories uh, like the famous uh, story artist Joe Ramped. I don't know. You know, so Joe Ramp was a person. Um, uh, unfortunately, he he passed in, in, a, in a very tragic car accident, which was he was. I, in my opinion, Joe Ramp was the heart and soul of Pixar. Oh, okay. Joe Ramp was also the voice of Heimlich, uh, the caterpillar in Bugs Life. Oh, yes, you know, I the, love the, that. Yeah. My favorite character. So, in Bugs so Life. that was Joe. <laughs> he was also instrumental in uh, that one movie about that Jack Skellington guy. Oh right. So uh, yeah, that one, no, that movie, nobody's ever, ever, never heard. Totally of it. been absolutely sycophantic about. <laughs> sycophantic about. So um, yeah, and um, but there was a story told to me about about Joe. Yeah. Where um, it was the the first Toy Story movie, right? It was an experiment with CG animation. Nobody ever done that sort of thing before, and yeah. they were really trying hard to make it right. And so um, he was going to pitch this sequence to the boss. And uh, the boss was out, you know, John Lester was out doing something. And, and this was a secondhand story, so it, I could be getting it wrong. But uh, John came back from his business trip and looked at Joe's boards yeah. and uh, said, 
no. Just right off. Just like, I don't like this. And instead of, you know, pouting and throwing a fit, Joe understood the disposability of story drawings. And he's like, well, if that's not what you want, he tears all the papers down off and start again. Here oh, we go. There you go. Yeah. You know, and that's like no two, weeks of, two, week, <laughs> two, two weeks of work down the drain. Yeah, that's impressive. And yeah. instead of instead of going in and pouting in a corner, he's like, well, if that's not right, then let's make it right. And uh, I think you're hitting about, on something important that people should be hearing if they want to get yeah. into this business. Well, there's a certain emotional maturity you kind of have to carry mm -hmm. in with you. You know, mm -hmm. I think if you're going to do anything in the public realm as far as, uh, you know, some sort of performance art mm -hmm. or um, anything, you kind of have to have, um, a, I guess some people would say a thick skin. Yeah. But yeah. I, I wouldn't say a thick skin. I think you just have to be more self-possessed. Yeah. You know, that you're not affected by every little whim of someone else coming after you. Yeah. And I think that displays a certain amount of emotional intelligence um, when people are able to separate their labor from what a story needs. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a phrase in story art that you have to kill your darlings sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I just went through something in, in, a, in a story uh, session. So... I work on a show right now called the Tuttle Twins on, on Angel uh, Studios, on mm -hmm. angel.com. And um, one of the characters uh, that we have is uh, uh, sort of like the, the father of the free market, the Scottish man, Adam Smith. <laughs> and there was a sh uh, 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 an episode where uh, Adam Smith gets a, a fish thrown at him. Yeah. By somebody, and he just he gets smacked in the face with a fish. And I was like, "We've got to do the fish bit," you know. <laughs> and at the end of this part, where we have Adam Smith explaining uh, the concept of the invisible hand of, of you know it, people doing things of benefit to one another, yeah. I want—I so wanted to throw that fish at him. Yeah, and we or didn't ham. have time for it yeah. right now, <laughs> right now. But we, I so so wanted to throw that fish at him, yeah. and uh, we didn't get a chance to do it because oh, we just a, didn't yeah. have the time. I would have wanted to draw the fish on the face. I know. <laughs> I know. It would have been great to do um, the fish. So, yeah, so your job could be filled with what it would have, could have, should have, but that's just kind of how it goes yeah. and you do what you do. And So here's another arrow for you, Kyle. All right. Let's this... do that. And so this means a turnaround. It's like if you do mm -hmm. an arrow like that, that means somebody is, you know, turning around and looking in the other direction. So this can be like the, the yellow sweater here and the map. You can kind of keep that in the general area. Excellent. Um, Look how quickly, this is amazing. The, the, this is the thing too about being able to draw with this much fluency and fluidity. Um, it's really a necessary ingredient in this part of the of the, the industry. And um, for those of you out there wondering about getting into this, uh, I would say, you know, and you could you please uh, tell me if I'm wrong here, but my guess is that in addition to just learning these these fundamentals I mentioned earlier, being able to turn form in simple ways, being able to break things down from big to small, et cetera. But also I think a, a really clear understanding of um, human anatomy, but not in the sense that you have to be a scientist about it, but just understanding enough proportion and enough, you have to be probably um, comfortable enough with being able to place a, a figure in an environment of a certain uh, size and being able to uh, simplify things down and understand how the body moves to a degree uh, all this stuff, it's its actually, if you think about it, story art combines a knowledge of so many fundamentals, um, you know, perspective, some anatomy, um, and probably even things like lighting. And it's its really a lot. Your vocabulary has to be pretty rich, I would say. Am I right, Mike, to be uh, able to do this well? Yeah, I would say that you kind of have to study a lot of different things. There's a lot of, uh, so let's have, you know, this character turn the map. Nice. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think what we can do is an over the shoulder shot here and have, we can see what's on the map. Oh, and we yeah. can see, like, you know, here's a, you know, a, a roundabout or something. And then we have this big, um, you know. Yeah, we clearly get what we're looking at. We there. clearly get that, like, that is right here, you know, or or just put an arrow that says, Eiffel Tower is here, right? And then the one hand's up here and the one hand is right there. And we see that that is coming from our character here. So can you tell me a little bit, I know you're just doing a lot of this is just instinctive at this point and the intuition is there, you know how to do it. But for people who are watching, um, there's also always this issue with focal points. So when you're drawing like this, you wanna be thinking, okay, I'm directing the eye 
Okay, so when somebody's watching, um, either they're reading a comic, which is more like what this is right now, since we're looking at these still images, but if you're also watching a movie, the way you direct people to what is important. Um, and so I, I know mm -hmm. you're in, with the compositions that you're creating right now, there has to be some of that going on in the back of your mind. Yes. Yeah, focal point is a big part of story art. Yeah. You know, and, on, and a lot of times what you'll do is have... Um, uh, what, a, what some people like to call visual barriers. Hmm. So, you know, in a composition, your eye is always wandering in a different place and you want that eye to wander in almost a circular or, or a cyclical way. Hmm. So you don't want the eye to escape. So oftentimes you'll see something like, you know, for instance, um, you know, just if I was to put an edge to the paper here, mm. then that would generally keep like this, this forms a, a barrier, you a get trapped visual in there. barrier. Yeah. And then you get trapped in there and then you look here and then it leads you back to here and down to here and back to here, mm. you know? So it, it works in like a very circular way, um, in a very cyclical way. Yeah, and makes that's sense. kind of what you want to do in compositions, mm. just generally, even if it's an illustration, if it's, if it's, you know, storyboard art, if it's an anim animated piece, a lot of the time you'll find, you know, stuff like this. You'll see like, you know, a tree Throw some or something like that, you know, and yeah. then there's something up here and there's a cloud up here and you see that over here is like a park and, you mm -hmm. know, and there's some kids playing and that's the focal point. They're throwing a ball or something like that, you know, and those kind of elements trap your eye in a way that is not only pleasing, but keeps you focused on what's important in the scene. Yeah. Um, there's a... Um, one of the the great directors on The Simpsons, uh, Mr. Mark Kirkland. Mm -hmm. uh, if you get a chance to to look at some of his stuff, I was one of my mentors, mm. and uh, and Mark always liked to put things in in what what he called a valley. Mm. You know, you have um, like something pointing toward the focal point. Like in in, in this case, um, we're gonna put uh, our protagonist here. In between these museums. Now, I've heard that described um, with, by Andrew Loomis and people like this as leading lines yes. in composition. There are elements that are actually there in the environment, but the the linear nature um, that they that they have is it's helping to direct you towards what you need to look at. Yeah, and we can have the you know the the map come down right here, and we're, we're not going to draw that because that's really effective though. That, that those diagonals are putting me right towards her face. Yep. Yep. And, uh, you know, I think that's when <coughs> when you're able to direct that, when you're able to lead that eye in a certain way. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that uh, we we really um, excel at in, in the world of 2D animation is having that, you know, controlling that 2D plane. Right? Yeah. Because a lot of the time, you know, when you look at uh, things, I don't know if you've ever experienced like virtual reality and some of those other things. Just once and I got car sick. Well, um, <laughs> so I can't do it. That is an entirely different way of, of storytelling because your audience has the ability to look anywhere they want. Oh, right, right. So right. it's very immersive in the fact that um, you can look around and there's, you know, something happening here, something happening here. And it's more like a live performance of something. Yeah, but you don't have that fixed frame that you yeah. can control the composition. Yeah. And the control, I think, is where the, the beauty of, of, you know, cinema yeah. Uh, lies is that you have that uh, ability to artistically uh, manipulate where people look. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's more like uh, it's more like uh, you know drawing a horse to water or or um, an enticement yeah. as as opposed to a, a system of force. Right. You know, and and I think that's a really important uh, as as storytellers to not. Uh, manipulate somebody in a, in a way that seems forceful. Right. You know, like, uh, for instance, like, oh, this character is cute just because they're cute. Mm. There's no particular rhyme or reason, but that's the cute character that you're supposed to think is cute. Yeah. You know, they don't do anything cute. They just stand there. Maybe they got big eyes or but something. You have like to that. have them do something or yeah. emote in some way. That, right. Exactly. Mm. And, and I think that sometimes you have to, uh, not just say they're cute, you have to show they're cute. Yeah. You know, there's, um, in, in boards, we always say that it's better to show than tell. Lingo. You said in boards. In boards. Well, that's short for storyboards. Okay. I want to make sure people know that. Um, yeah. It's better to show than tell. It is better to show than tell mm -hmm. oftentimes. 
because you know you see a lot of films that uh, are kind of like talky talk. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's, that's, that's another friend. It's oh, it's a little it's all talky right here. Too much exposition through the dialogue and through the mm -hmm. right. So you have like like two talking heads essentially. You mm -hmm. have one person. I, I want to say this. Oh, I want to say this. 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 You know, instead of showing uh, what's going on, right? You know, maybe they're maybe they're talking about uh, you know uh, like two people sitting at, at a at a at a French bistro, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, I had that experience. I was having dinner with my with my mother last night, mm -hmm. and we were sitting at this uh, cute little bistro with all these flowers everywhere and and stuff and. Uh, you know, you, watching all the people and their different mannerisms at, at different tables and the best and, thing to uh, do in Paris. There's yeah. nothing better. Yeah, people watching <laughs> people in Paris watch is incredible. It's heaven. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and um, just the different ways that people even ate. Yeah, was yeah. telling of their personality. You know, mm. uh, I, I, on on the ride over here, I was watching this uh, this older uh, Parisian lady nibble on some cookies, and I don't know why it was so fascinating to me. I just do. this. <laughs> This because uh, it's great. Just the the mannerism that she had was mm -hmm. was was just so like dainty, but also straightforward at mm -hmm. the same time. Mm -hmm. And it was just fascinating. And I think you know, if you are going into the creative arts, you have to have an eye and and be interested in things like that. Yeah, interested in people, interested in what they do and why they do the things they do. Yeah, you know, to kind of like go back to the Jerry Seinfeld thing, like why do they do the things right. they do? Right. You know, and that's what you're looking at. You're you're an observer. And you can take those observations and put that into your work, and that makes your work really authentic, I feel like. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, I think anybody who wants to be in, in some kind of creative um, art form, whatever it happens to be, if it's writing or drawing or filmmaking or even uh, music, dance, whatever it is, uh, to be somebody who observes um, using all of your senses. And mm. uh, you have to really turn up their powers of observation, not just through your eyes, but the sense of smell and what you're hearing, it all just is going to feed into um, it. Basically, you're giving yourself a nice um, collection of uh, sensory experiences that you can draw on later, no pun intended, uh, when you do uh, return to your, your art form, whatever it is. Um, oh, come I, on, I that, that pun was totally intended. It was intended. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mike, you know me too well. You know me too well. Listen, Don't lie to me, Kyle. <laughs> If at first you don't succeed, skydiving is not for you. That's my advice for you today, <laughs> folks. Um, Mike and I are doing dad jokes here. So, we'll be yeah. here all night. Yeah. Um, okay, tip your, <laughs> tip your waitresses. Listen, we're going to get back to the uh, the drawing here. So you've just had our character now. Look at the map and look up, not see what they're looking for. Look up again, it looks like, and not see what they're looking for. And um, I think these walls are serving also as, as sort of barriers to what it is that yeah. she is looking for. Which I love. It's you're using the environment as as a character in the story, and you can also do something like just a hint of actually what you know they're looking for in the back oh, here. Oh, right! I so love the, it. You know that the idea of dramatic tension, right? Yeah. Where the audience knows something that the character does it, and so you see that a lot of time in suspense thrillers. Excellent. You know, like there's the shadow that's coming behind them, but they don't see it. Right, oh my gosh! Right, and right. you're just like biting your nails because you know that the killer lurks or whatever. Right, right. But right. E even then, you know, they have they have a lot in uh, in comedies where uh, the character is, you know, looking for something, and the audience can see it in plain sight, but the character can't see it, mm. and you know, that's the, uh, the the that tension that you're building with your audience. This is like a mini masterclass we're getting from Mike today on, on just all of these wonderful things that go into the art of storytelling, the art of visual storytelling, but just all these considerations um, for how to make it better, for how to make it effective. So folks, I hope you're taking notes. Um, I'm going to pause for a moment. I say folks because there are people watching the show who may have questions. Frank, do we have any questions from our lovely audience? So, so far, we are having uh, already Delphine, which was our winner. Oh, yesterday. yeah, our big winner. Yeah. She said, oh, cool. Uh, if you need uh, good addresses in Paris restaurants, just ask for her. She okay. Can, oh, that's very nice. She, she can give you answers around that. Um, no, so far, uh, yeah, Nikki is asking if you're using uh, Kyle's brush to draw right now. Oh, I think there was a preloaded brush. Yes. Whatever it is. Yes. <laughs> this is one of Kyle's beautiful brushes. Um, I'm sure that uh, you will be able to find it online somewhere. Um, it's in the marker set. So just go to Photoshop, go to the uh, um, 
the menu in your brushes menu to get more brushes, obtenir plus pinceaux, c'est ça? And you will be able to uh, log in with your Adobe credentials and grab the art marker uh, set, which has, I think, something like 50 to 60 different markers to play with. So, um, and if you're interested in story art, it's kind of fun to draw with markers. I think, you know, going back to when everybody was using Copics and uh, Prismacolors and all those fun things. Yeah. Um, in the old story rooms, there used to be just a pile of Sharpies in these um, mm. 16 by 9 ratio uh, animation paper. Oh, cool. Oh, gosh, they were beautiful. Yeah. I love uh, that that uh, kind of paper is just heavenly to draw on. Yeah, yeah. There are these certain things with physical media that have gone by the wayside uh, in the name of efficiency and, and um, moving things to digital. But uh, I, when I started working, um, it, I worked in an ad agency in the late 90s and they had um, a studio, a physical studio in the building where everybody sat at their drafting tables with their markers and did comps for the um, for the ads. Uh, the art directors and creative directors would have these comps that they would bring to their meetings with the clients and the, the marker comps that some of these artists did were just fantastic. Um, all right, so thank you. Now, uh, we do have people watching who might wanna win something. So I think it's time for us to just do a quick little uh, giveaway. So if you're watching, you have um, two things you can win today. One is a actual ticket to the events uh, day pass, I believe, right, Frank? It's a single day pass mm -hmm. for, it's oh, it's a three day pass. Oh my yeah. goodness. That's I don't know, Mike. Huge. Goodness gracious. Yeah, oh my gosh. But you need to be attending. Right, yeah. okay. Don't, don't waste it. <laughs> yeah. It would you, be a shame. To not go. You can come me. see me at 9.30, the first, uh, the first um, if you wake up. speech. 9.30, yeah. uh, 9.30 on Friday. There you go, folks. Yeah. If you're enjoying what's happening right now, and know you are, there's more mic to be had, okay? And that's tomorrow at 9.30, okay? <laughs> more mic for everybody. Oh, boy. Well, or for one of you. <laughs> so, not quite everybody. Um, all right, the other option is um, you can also win a virtual ticket to the show, which also is going to entitle you to a year of master classes through uh, IAMAG. Our good friend Patrice over there at IAMAG. Merci, Patrice. Très généreux. Okay, so here we go. If you want to win the three-day pass, the physical pass, okay, I want you to type in the chat in YouTube, live, L-I-V-E. Paris. Oh, sorry. What are we typing? Paris. Oh, Paris. What, what that We're mean? typing Paris. P-A-R-I-S. Paris. I'm sorry. I just wrote it down to make it easy. For okay, Frank is already telling you in the chat what to write. I'm, don't listen to me. All right, so it's going to be, you're <laughs> going to type Paris. If you want to win the virtual ticket, what do they type, Frank? Live stream. You type live stream. See how I almost got those completely mixed up? Either way, you're going to win something great. But if you want to do the virtual one, type live stream. If you want a chance to win the actual tickets for the event because you happen to live somewhere near Les Halles, here in Paris, then you are in good shape. Type Paris, P-A-R-I-S, P-A-R-I-S. Je peux toujours uh, and, 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 écrire les choses en français. Yeah, that's, that's not so bad. <laughs> we're having a few people already playing, and I see that in the, in the audience we have uh, Thomas, who won yesterday the three days pass, and he was Ooh. also excited afterwards. Yeah, great. Thomas, awesome. congratulations, uh, félicitations, and j'espère que oui, pour pour demain, j'espère que oui, j'espère que vous êtes uh, <coughs> vous êtes là demain, mm. et samedi et dimanche. Here's a little uh, something that you All can right. see. This this symbol here, OS, uh -huh. often means off screen. Okay, what does that mean? That means this character is moving out of the page. Okay, they're moving out of the frame, and yeah. we see them heading out. Okay. So we see uh, we see our character here uh, going from looking at the the map with the Eiffel Tower, you mm -hmm. know, in the background, and then looking around. I don't know where to go, so I'm just going to go this way. Aha. Uh -huh. And then we see that she is leaving frame. Excellent. And then that's a good place to switch the scene. Yeah. Right? We have different places that this character can look. I mean, for example, what do, what do you think? What's a good, a good um, place? I think, well, now we've been dealing, it looks like, mostly with um, man-made 
or human made structures. Mm -hmm. So maybe um, wandering into a little park of some kind or uh, maybe the Seine, the river, by the river or I don't know, something more organic these, up uh, to you. One of, one of these statues that uh, we see. Oh, you know, so of, many great uh, statues. People. Yes, this is just, it's interesting because now you're just, you're moving towards a different kind of shape, a different kind of um, form to enjoy. There. Yeah, that's obviously still not the the object that we're looking for. And I think that, you know, that might be a little large in the frame. So I'm just going to get the lasso out and uh, snag this here. And because it's not reading as a as, uh, statue yet, because one of the things that you want to think about in story art is um, just the, the fact that you should be able to look at something and get a very quick read on what that is visually. Would you um, classify that as something that falls under in, in the classification of silhouette, the importance of silhouette? Absolutely. Silhouette is 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 of vital importance. Mm. Um, silhouette is a great way to communicate a lot of things. Mm. Like in this in this case, the you know, we're we're not gonna belabor this uh, monument here. Right. But you're but, putting it on a pedestal of some kind and automatically it becomes a yes. statue. Mm-hmm. That's really smart. Mm. And then like here's the street and here's some sort of other thing and perhaps there's uh, you know, some sort of um, grass area in front of this thing. And uh, we can see, uh, I'm just going to make a quick copy of this. Oops. That was not right. I have to go back to my move tool and then hold down Alt and then grab that, pull it over. Then deselect. And then we can have uh, our character come in and obviously, you know, not large. Yes. You know, scale is a big thing, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Staging is important. Staging is important for a couple of different reasons. Like, you want to be able to impart a certain psychology mm. to uh, the staging that you do because, um, you know, given that you have a very small character and everything else around them is large, mm -hmm. that's very intimidating, mm. right? Yeah. I don't know if you've ever been in a room full of very large people. I'm always in a room full of large people because I'm five foot six, barely. At least that's what it says in my driver's license, folks. I'm five, yeah. five and a half. So what are you going to do? But like, you know. And what, I live in Germany now. Oh. And everyone's. <laughs> everybody's like, you know, six foot five. Yeah, not and, quite Dutch, but they're tall. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, so so you know, you understand the idea of, of being in in a, in a place where you're a small thing in a place of huge wonders. Yeah, yeah. And lost. Yeah. You know, and so that that becomes a, an issue. But you can play with that sort of psychology in your staging mm -hmm. to where it emphasizes the fact that you're lost. Yeah, and that totally works. You don't know what it's you're where you're going small. or why. I also notice, and this is probably something you just do automatically, but she exits on the left and enters now on the right. So she's moving in the same direction when she exited the screen, yes. moving in one direction, enters. So there's a continuity there that's really great. Well, uh, th that's uh, generally known as screen direction. Screen direction, okay. Yeah, and you wanna keep that really consistent because there's a certain film grammar that you want to, um, kind of like something that's been mutually agreed upon over decades, mm. you know, that this is kind of how you make a film feel smooth yeah. and feel like, um, it uh, it flows really well. Yeah, you know I think there's a um, I can't remember. I think it's Jaws, but um, uh, Steven Spielberg in that movie um, has a shot in which somebody goes from screen left or screen right to screen left, mm -hmm. right? And even though uh, the the angle changes from one side to the other, yeah, they still go in that same direction, and mm -hmm. you even though. The camera changed. They would have gone the other way, but but they go the 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 way that they were to going keep the movement to consistent. keep the screen direction consistent. Fascinating, you know. So he knew that already. That that was the way to go. That was the decision to make. Yeah. Even though, mm. and oftentimes he's pretty good, right? Uh, yeah, he's made a couple of really good movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Stephen, if you're watching this, and um, <laughs> you're awesome. Really, <laughs> super love your movies. Um, but. Uh, yeah, keeping that consistent because the worst thing that you can do as a story artist is is take people out mm. of the story. Yeah. 
right? You don't want to take them out of the story. You want to captivate them into the story. And so... Um, you don't want the boom mic to be dropping into the shot. No. But you don't want to. You don't want to be, them to be thinking about the filmmaking, right, just the right, story. Right. You know, if if they're busy worrying about the, if they're confused at the filmmaking choice, you've lost them. It's no longer totally immersive. Right? Yeah. Well, you've lost them, and then they're going to catch. They're going to need to catch up. Right. Then it's like, well, I was thinking about that, so I don't know what's happening now, and so in their mind, they're playing catch up and trying to piece together the the, the parts that they missed. Right. 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 And that's you've lost them at that point. Yeah, it's, and it's then pretty... that's a great place to go up and get a snack, and then you you know kind of like, yeah. do you don't care for a little while maybe about what happens because you lost the the point of this one thing, you know? It's really a delicate thing, isn't it? Telling a story well, it, you could lose them at any moment with just the wrong little moment, the wrong little decision. Um, yeah, it's treacherous. Well, that's why they always say you know storyboarding is re storyboarding. Mm. You know, boarding is reboarding. Is what the what the the phrase is because you keep iterating and honing that down into its most basic uh, components to where it's so readable and so understandable, yeah, and clear, and yet so, artfully clear. That goes back to what you were saying earlier about not being precious. I think people watching should know if you want to get into this, be prepared to make tons of revisions and to always be. Always be editing, always be changing, always be until to arrive at the best possible product and to not feel like you're going to nail it out of the gate. Because you won't. Right. And, and, and you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, you can. I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say that you shouldn't and you can't. Sure, because obviously fair. there are going to be those people that are just that good. Yeah. And I think that's a great thing to strive for. With concept art, it's Paul Felix. I don't know if you know Paul Felix. I know Paul Felix. Good grief. I know Paul Felix, yeah. and Paul Felix is annoyingly good. Folks, <laughs> if you think that uh, there aren't gods among men, just look up Paul Felix. <laughs> and just know that Paul Felix is an incredibly nice person. He is. And that makes it worse somehow. <laughs> All right, just personal quick story about Paul Felix. I walked into Paul Felix's office and said, I can't believe how well you're drawing. You're so amazing. And he had a bunch of pencil drawings sitting on a on his desk and I said, oh, look at this one. It's amazing. And I just kept gushing and gushing and gushing. And when it was all said and done, he said, well, um, I don't know. Some of these are okay. This is what I'm working on right now. So he literally just took all the stuff I said, shoved it to the side and was kind of like, okay, that's fine. Here's what I'm doing right now. And um, he's just so so humble and shouldn't be because he's amazing. Yeah, we, we had a, a similar artist on uh, The Simpsons, another Paul, Paul Wee. Uh -huh. And Paul Wee was very much in the same way. It's just beautiful draftsmanship yeah just a, a, you know pristine art that he does he he was he was the one that ran all of the um life drawing sessions oh that we would do after hours so i love that they have that in studios still. Yeah. yeah uh i don't know if they do it now but well, i haven't also i have a, also haven't worked there in like 10 years oh i don't know i know so. disney disney still um was doing it last time i checked um they were at T tv animation mm -hmm. for quite some time still mm -hmm. So, it's so it's so I, great. I hope that they keep that, you know, up because, you know, we all need the practice. We all need to be able to have opportunities to improve. Yeah. Because, like, I feel like a lot of people end up getting into this sort of um, bubble that they live in. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, you do what's comfortable. Yeah, we all do that. Yeah. And, and that is fine in a certain way. So you draw what you like and you draw what you feel comfortable with. But then you start, you hit a plateau at some point. Yeah. Where you have drawn that thing well enough that it's no longer a challenge. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that you that you do. There's a formula that you start to follow. Sure. And therein lies the trap. Yeah. Right? That you get too comfortable uh, and you stop striving for something that's new and different. And so, um, you know... It, it just goes back to, to keep challenging yourself and to keep challenging your, your art and keep moving forward. Yeah. I like think, Paul Felix. Oh, my gosh. We have to talk about him again? Well, he didn't want it. But, but, <laughs> but the thing about Paul Felix is that he was more interested in what he was working on now and said, you know, that was a step that I took. Yeah. And I'm going to take another step. It's crazy because every step was great. But um you just uh, made me think of something too, which is uh, when you're not challenging yourself and fo falling on, on these, these these habits and these formulas and all that, you yourself as an artist can also, without even realizing it, get a little bored. 
and you don't notice that your work is a little subpar because you're repeating yourself over and over again. You're not challenging yourself. So your brain is actually not as stimulated by going through the motions, basically. And that can be the same in any aspect of life. We've all experienced that with a job or just with, you know, living in the same neighborhood forever. Um, and don't think it doesn't apply to art and to other creative skills. You've got to challenge yourself and, and get yourself to another level or at least infuse your work with new inspiration and new techniques and new ideas, even if it's a little messy and you're not so good at it at first. I often get asked the question, um, by, you know, when I'm doing reviewing student portfolios, mm. how can I get better? Mm. And uh, my answer is always go to where you're uncomfortable. Mm. Um, go, go do something that's absolutely counter to what you normally do. Like if you're a comedy person, try action. Mm. If you're an action person, try horror. Mm. If you're a horror person, try comedy. You know, try yeah. drama. Yeah. Try doing something that's absolutely opposite to what you do. And that way um, you are forced to stretch yourself. Yeah, and you're getting those neurons firing again that need to be. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. So Switch genre, switch medium. If you're just pen and ink all the time, mm -hmm. try doing something that has a lot less control. Yeah. You know? Or just just go into that uncomfortable space. Mm. You know? Um, it's like uh, the, you know, the, the old Star Trek. You boldly go where you haven't gone before. Oh, yeah. Good old Captain Kirk. Um, hey, Frank, who won? I haven't won yet. You know oh, the suspense is just too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to get dramatic to tension. I know, it's dramatic board. tension. By the way, this whole time, Mike is here chatting, but also drawing. And he's got our character walking into frame and uh, walking up to where we see this this statue. And probably, I guess, walking behind the statue now. Yeah. We're just, just passing just, through just this shot. Passing through. Just not... Found would we, would we see a little peak of the Eiffel Tower up there, like just still still there in the background behind that building, or no? I, I, I think I think if we were to be kind of mean about it, it would be too. We much. would just pan over, and there's the Eiffel Tower, like right there. Even better. <laughs> see, this is why he's the pro. <laughs> I think if we were going to be particularly nasty that's about fun. it, <laughs> I think that's fun. It would just be like you know the thing that's hiding behind the one the one bush. Right, you know? right, 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 right. And uh, there's. Uh, the uh, the concept of the reveal, yeah, you know, in, yeah. in in storyboards and in filmmaking in general, uh, the Simpsons was like they're the masters of the reveal, mm -hmm. you know. That was constantly a joke that, you know, Simpsons yeah, something is <laughs> happening, and then you reveal a completely different, uh, a completely different uh, situation circumstance. All right. Okay. Uh, it's like, um, have you been on the, to the haunted mansion at uh, in Disneyland? The one in Florida I went to, you mean the one that they based that recent film on? The one in Disney World in Florida? No, no, the, the original one in Anaheim. Oh, is that? The, I guess they rebuilt it also in, in Florida. I went to the yeah. haunted mansion in Florida when I was like 12. Yeah, there's a there's a uh, the chateau here at the Paris Disneyland. Oh, there's a there's a Paris there's Disneyland. The, the Phantom, the Phantom, uh, Phantom Chateau or something like that. Oh, I can't remember. I didn't even know there was yeah. a Paris Disneyland. <laughs> yeah, but anyways, they they did this uh, 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 what I like to call a triptych reveal. Uh huh. So there's uh you know a portrait yeah. of somebody, and they looked really really dignified and very you know. Uh, it's a it's a nice portrait. There's a a young woman with a, a a parasol. Yeah. And there's a you know a stately man in a suit, and he's you know striking a pose. Yeah. And then as the painting grows, you see that there's not exactly what is supposed to be. Like that man uh, obviously was. Um, on uh, you know a, a call because he wasn't wearing pants. He's in, oh, okay. you know he's got these like striped boxer shorts going. That's on. That's great. Yeah. And then the third twist of the gag was that he's standing on a barrel full of, of gunpowder, <laughs> and it's lit, and he's about to get blown to heck. <laughs> and then uh, the other one is that the you know the girl with the parasol. Yeah. Her first one is is you you pan down and you see that she's on a tightrope. Oh, neat. And then underneath that, and the third part of the gag. Uh, was that there's an alligator underneath her? Oh, excellent! Waiting yeah. and waiting to uh, swallow her whole. Oh, I like, and, I like um, that. Yeah. So that was an exercise that that uh, you know we do to, to have those reveals. But you get and, that extra one. It's one thing to have the yeah. one reveal, but the triptych is really nice. That's fun. yeah, yeah. And uh, in uh, the Simpsons, there's my favorite thing is where he Homer um, tries the skateboarding trick, falls into the chasm, uh, the gorge, 
Oh this. yeah, the, and they the, airlift the him out. Jump Springfield Gorge. Yeah, airlift him out. Put him in the back of an ambulance. Ambulance immediately hits a tree. <laughs> yes, Homer goes bouncing out <laughs> of the ambulance and then falls back down <laughs> the gorge. <laughs> that yeah. Anyway, yeah. I think that's like a double triptych because there were three things that happened and then three more things. Anyway, yeah, that was so. Well, great. That, that's a a, a, re- a repeating gag. It's really uh, good. A rever- it went in reverse. But yeah, it was so so funny. Because the ambulance went literally a foot and hit the tree yeah. before he went flying back up. <laughs> yeah. You guys, I swear it's funny. Look it up. Springfield Gorge, um, Homer Simpson. And, and and they were really good about that kind of um, silly comedy. Yeah, you know? it's just pure silliness. And and I love silly comedy. Me too. I, it just, it strikes such a chord. And I, I think so, so often now, especially nowadays, I feel like we're, we're all taking ourselves so seriously. Yeah, just be silly. And uh, yeah. I love that that playful silliness. I think we need to bring back playfulness. Well, I think, you know, what's funny is um, with uh, my kids, the things they responded to uh, when I was reading them picture books and things um, were the picture books that were just zany, strange, bizarre, uh, didn't in any way reflect the reality around them or were silly. Um, uh, you know, didn't they didn't necessarily have to have any kind of deep, meaningful message or anything about anything really real. Uh, they were just fun. And I think that's really interesting to think about because, um, you know, for, for those of us who make content for all ages, mm. you don't grow out of enjoying silliness and fun, right? It's not like just because you get more aware of all the horrible stuff that's going on in the world that you can't enjoy some really stupid, dumb, silly humor. <laughs> I think that's really a, a lifelong thing. I mentioned, I don't mm-hmm. know, if we, did we do this on the... I think we were live when we talked about Three Stooges, right? At the beginning of the show. Were we? Yeah. I don't I know if we were, were live, but we were talking about Three it, Stooges. That's just pure nonsense. Pretty sure we pure were nonsense. Live. It's just ridiculous stupidity. Silly, slapstick comedy, you know, sometimes just hits a chord. Yeah. You know, and uh, I think just the, the uh, absurdity of, cer- of certain situations uh, mm. sometimes can just strike a funny bone that is hard to strike in other ways. Yeah, there's a scene in uh, in a, a Peter Sellers um, Pink Panther movie where he's on a treadmill in a workout room, and um, he decides he talks to the person he's uh, uh, he, who's in the room with him and says, "You know, oh look, you have a little um, set of parallel bars," and he jumps on the parallel bars and starts swinging back and forth. And as he's talking to somebody and bragging about how great he is on the parallel bars, he decides to dismount on the other side from where he got on, and there's a staircase there. So he flies off the parallel bars directly onto a staircase and falls down into another room on a, a floor below. <laughs> and um, there's something about the physical comedy of that. And it, it is, again, one of these things where there's a reveal because you don't know there's a staircase there. You just see him dismount. And he doesn't know, obviously. But um, on film, it looks so hilarious. And I've probably seen that scene about, I don't know, 100 times. And I never don't laugh. Sorry for the double negative, but it's always, always happening. I always laugh at that because it's brilliant. Um, and I know that when I'm 99 years old, if I live that long and I see it again, I'll laugh because yeah. it's just fun and stupid. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, I, I love uh, farcical comedies. <laughs> yeah, that's good too. You know, farce like, is, a good uh, farce is a good farce. A good farce is a good farce. Mm-hmm. Like we, you know, some of those older uh, farces like Airplane or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the the Naked Gun movies or any of those that are I've just shown like these to my kids. <laughs> anything with Leslie Nielsen essentially. Yeah. Um, you know, like uh, the the old joke from from Airplane. Surely you don't mean this. He's like, of course surely I mean it, and don't call serious. me Shirley. Yeah, surely you can't be serious. <laughs> I, I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. Um, plays on words. Uh, Jim Gaffigan is another one oh, yeah, that I feel like he's really good at having that little twist in the comedy at the end. Yeah, yeah, he's very good. But it's an art form like any other. Um, and we talked earlier about when you're drawing, like being able to infuse even a simple drawing with comedy. So you have to have a sense of understanding timing mm-hmm. and where a character is rel- relative to what else is in their environment, um, what is preceding the drawing you're doing and knowing what's going to follow, creating a little bit of uh, suspense. Um, for the audience where they don't see what's coming next and then when they do it's done in a way that is surprising and surprising in a funny way I think a lot of this also comes from um, and this is going to sound like bad advice for all the people out there who are parents and have kids who spend way too much time on screens but spending time watching quality uh, films and shows 
where this is done really well. I mean, a show like The Simpsons, for example, is a masterclass in pure in, in various kinds of comedy, mm-hmm. right? There are plays on words. There's physical comedy. There's absurdity. It's just all these multi levels of of all the you know the vocabulary of comedy. Um, learning that will make you a better artist. So instead yeah. of sitting there and scrolling through uh, you know Instagram and Mister um, Mister what's his face, the one who has four hundred million followers, Mister Beast, Mister Beast, and things like that. It, instead of just going like through an hour of five minute videos that aren't really going to stick with you. Um, Spend an hour watching something that people have been talking about for 50 years and still talk about today as an example of a good piece of fill in the blank. This is great horror. This is great comedy. This is great whatever. And understand what makes it really, really good and timeless. Um, yeah. We're going to do a quick time check. Frank, how are we doing and where do you want us to go with so, the stream today? Very first thing, we had a twist in the game. A twist? Yeah. That's kind of on yeah. topic. <laughs> you, you wouldn't guess, but Pierre Meunier won the challenge. Isn't Pierre, he now? But he's already... Isn't he already there? Yeah. yeah okay. He's already there. So he's already going. He decided to give it back to uh, Super M, which has been uh, very talkative and tried to get that. So that's very nice of him. Super it's very nice, M? Pierre. Uh, Super M Factory. Super M Factory. Yeah, we get a winner. And now... Is this, just, I hope Super M Factory brings a Super M to yeah. Pierre. I hope for so. his trouble. Indeed. Uh, let, let, let's see if the factory is on today. We're gonna I don't see know. That. Congratulations I'm, to Super M. I'm trying to to make the... Um, Being a and, person and whose first name and last name starts with M, <laughs> I would enjoy having a Super M of my own. That'd be pretty good. Sure. Congratulations to Super M's parents for being bold enough to name mm-hmm. Super M Super as the first name. That's that's a great choice. So um, good job, mom and dad of Super M. And who is the other winner? So far, we I haven't pulled yet. So I'm okay, going to pull we don't know the the other winner just yet. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll pause play. for a little magic trick there. Yeah. Whoa! Oh. All right, let's. Get, I didn't see it. But it's it, okay. It, it was, was very the, magic. In it my was for the camera. Vision. It was for the camera. Uh, so now we've got another. Oh, look at this! We've changed to another. This is perfect. Up pops our character. See the arrow? We're moving up, popping up from the bushes, looking, and then popping down. That See, that's funny. Another one is in. You have a little circle that says in. And moves into frame? Is that moves, what moves into frame. The character comes in. The character goes out. To, Excellent. Uh, you know, in and then off screen. Very nice. Two. Sometimes people, go, people use out, but generally uh, that can be confused as this shot has been cut out of the film. Oh, well, you don't want so that. Sometimes some people can communicate that in a different way, like when they do notes or something like that. Right, right. And uh, so OS is generally a, a usually acceptable That term. That was off screen again? Was it off screen. Yeah. OS is off screen. And in, of course, is in. Very nice. Um, you don't have to do IS or anything like that. Oh, look, now you've panned over and it was right there behind her. Yep. Isn't so that you great? can put uh, some, some sort of building back here, <clears throat> or, you know. Some sort of uh, thing that then blocking. So we are on a we're on a fifteen minute countdown. We've got about fifteen minutes left, and I think that's plenty of time to get to the reveal. I can't believe you've done this whole scene and with far more frames than I thought you were going to use. I'm kind of blown away here. This is really amazing. <laughs> well, I, I do this for a living. I so. well, we we can see that now. <laughs> <laughs> you learn a couple of things in ten years of, of boarding every day. I would think so. Yeah. Very, uh, very cool to watch this all happen in real time. This is really neat. So I think, you know, we, we could go with, uh, you know, uh, just some sort of, um, I, I think there needs to be some sort of uh, sadness or, or, you know. Oh, yeah, a moment of down. The a downbeat. moment of the downtrodden mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. kind of um, feeling where, um, I'll just put this up here so people can actually see it. Um I think that it can be, you know, uh, we can just draw some pillars here, you know. Oh, nice. Of, you know, some sort of thing you see, like, you don't have to see. One thing that always draws people attention is type. Type, uh-huh. type, yeah. the color red, and um, movement. Those are the three big draws of, of eye. So you can see something like, you know, Musee, uh, 
to Paris or, or something like that, you know. Whatever. Museum of Paris. There's a like a door or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh you know the the Roman style pillars or or whatever in front. Mm. Um see again, really really simple setting the setting the environment there the place set sense of place but just the bare bones of what's needed and it's enough. It's really great. Just the minimum requirement to make it readable yeah. and understandable quickly. Um, that's all that you can really ask for. Totally effective. And then we'll just, oh, that's the wrong layer. So I'm going to move the right. For some reason, it's auto-selecting. There. That little ah, bit of Auto-select. Yeah, ah. I've had that happen before. Oh, Photoshop, you surprise me all the time. Hopefully in good ways sometimes. <laughs> Hopefully in good ways sometimes. You never can quite tell. Fickle mistress, that Photoshop. I'm a huge fan of Photoshop. Been using it for 26 years now. Yeah. But um, sometimes I'll, I'll tap on a tiny, tiny little toggle somewhere. Or I'll accidentally hit a key command I didn't mean to hit. And something will turn on or off and I'll be searching for <laughs> 10 minutes trying to figure out what I did wrong. Well, the depth of Photoshop is impressive. It goes, um, you know, I mean, but this is like the rings of a tree when you've been adding to a product for about 30, how many years now, Photoshop? 35 mm -hmm. years? Mm. Yeah. So I think that we can do um, a panel of, you know, and, and people, um, for as much as we claim to be individuals and different from one another, there are universalities about everyone. Mm. You know, where, wherever Paris is obviously a huge melting pot and you get people from all over the world that come here. Mm. And we all have a lot of the same mannerisms when you watch us look around. Yeah. You know, yeah. they're different, different takes or variations on a theme. But if we're happy, we smile. If we're right. sad, we frown. If we're angry, our brows furrow down. Right. And so I think there's like universal gestures that you can often do. And when people are sad, they so tend body to. body language and facial expressions are pretty well, you know, understood by everybody. Yeah. So you have our, our, our character here who's walking in, clutching that map, mm -hmm. trying to figure out where she went wrong. Um, and just not having a fun time anymore. Right. It's gotten to a point where now it's it's frustrating and yeah. sad. Yeah. Disappointing. Or angry is is another is another you know emotion. Like whatever. I didn't really want to see it that badly anyway. Now look at how look how effective that facial expression is. Just a couple of lines, but that's all you need. Very effective. You know, another thing you can also do is just like, you know, just chuck that map. Yes, excellent. That's even better. Great idea. You know, I'm 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 done. You know, great kinda, job. Yeah, I love that. I love that thing. Just, and we all understand that too. It's like this. Looking for this thing is for the birds. I, I'm I'm never gonna find it. It's going to be, you know, the the, the universal giving up. Mm -hmm. Like I'm done. This is this has gone beyond the point of a, of a fun search into frustrating endeavor. And we see the character moving now slightly to the left, so we know that they're going to probably walk off, walk out of frame. Is that what's happening here? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I think one 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 thing that we can do here is, um, you know, have them, you know, walk off, or we can just. Uh, for the sake of time, we will just notate that uh -huh. and put an arrow in right here and then this little bouncy tail on it Oh, cool! to say walking. Walking to OS, chucks the map, and then uh, we can see some sort of, uh, you know, corner here and uh, comes in. Looking for the station. Oh, great. I love that. Okay, we're literally turning a corner now. <laughs> yeah, and then great. we can have, uh, you know, the, this uh, 
this sort of multiplane out. And multiplane, are you familiar with the term multiplane? No, no, no. This is, and so, even if I were, I would ask you to explain so it. So in, in the old uh, Disney days, uh, the Walt Disney Corporation, or Walt Disney Company, Animation Studios at the time, oh, the developed ca- the camera. a camera yes, I have that was this. multi-layered. Yes. And if you've seen them, they're about 20 feet tall. Yes, I went to the right? studio and it's, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And you see all of these gears and knobs and, and you know, turning wheels and, and, and cranks and things. And um, they even had to uh, a, a, account for the tinting of the glass. Oh my gosh. And so as the higher you went, yeah. the grayer the paint got because the vibrant colors at the bottom would get grayed out by so many layers of glass. That's so interesting. That's why the older films have that sort of more muted palette to How them about that? because of the glass color. So you have to explain to people what this is because yeah. the camera's on top and you have multiple layers underneath it where you can have different paintings. Yeah, different it's, cells. You had these pieces of clear celluloid yeah, that like had foreground, paintings middle, on background, them. background, but even more. Yeah, and then what you would do is the camera would code down and they would have to do these really complicated mathematical equations yeah. to have smooth movement between each of these plates. So as, you know, the, the concept of parallax yeah. that we sort of take for granted, like the, for instance, if you're driving through, uh, you know, like uh, like Arizona or Nevada or one of those, where there's just vast territory. Yeah. And you see everything close to you is moving at, at right. so these fast. Cact- these cacti are moving yeah, quickly. Yeah, exactly. But... Everything close to you is moving really fast yeah. as you're going, you know, 80 miles an hour down the highway. And then the, the mountains in the background hardly move. Yeah. Right? right? And so that was a way to simulate that kind of movement in parallax with this multiplane camera. Yeah. So you'd have like long, big, long drawings or, or paintings on celluloid, and those would pan through by just crank little bits, cranking little bits, take a picture, crank a little bit, take a picture. And all of these would be moving all at once and simulating depth. Amazing. So uh, I think it was the old mill was the first uh, cartoon that utilized as sort of like a test. Is it 1930s? When was that? I think it was 1930s. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This was precursor to Snow White. Yeah. Okay. Because so, they yeah, used 30. they used that on Snow White. They used the multiplane camera to great effect. Mm-hmm. Um, so, anyways, I think we can do this uh, character here turning the corner, and just like, you know, looking out of the corner of her eye. You know, I'm just I'm so you know, done. It's incredible to me that. Um, we didn't even talk about this, but you, with the very first drawing, created a character with a distinct look. And I know people are- It's observation, even, really. It's, Mostly <laughs> observation. We, <laughs> we do have Mike's mom right here. Yeah, who you don't you see is my mom, see. who this cartoon is kind right of there. based on I right know, now. Off, <laughs> wait, off screen. Oh, she's OS. She's OS. She's OS right OS now. OS at the moment. Yeah. Um, but but I was going to say, like, it's amazing that 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 is even a part of this. That's an ingredient in here we didn't even talk about. But you have a character and there are specifics. We've got the glasses of a certain shape of a certain size arranged in a certain uh, way with the facial features. It's all it seems like, oh, that's so simple. But this is another important ingredient here. Um, you just made me think of something, though, that we're going to say with the character design and... Uh, Prior to that, oh, I was going to say, if anybody happens to be in the Burbank area in California, you have a chance to go to visit the Walt Disney Animation Studios. You can see that um, that multiplane that camera. Multiplane camera. It's really an amazing. Yeah, they have one in the Frank Wells Building. Is that's, that is that's, that where I saw it? It's probably the Frank Wells Building on the lot proper. The old uh, Disney lot. The where I went, the one I went, I went to a couple places, but one had the had the seven dwarves up on the, the yeah. statue, and then I walked in, and we all walked around and did some stuff, and then yeah, those are the executive offices. Okay, so then I must have gone. So to the it's other the one building too. across the the little uh, plaza from there. Where's the building where I would have seen Paul Felix? Uh, feature animation across the street. Okay. Okay. So the building, the buildings that uh, that Walt Disney built for the animators uh, mm-hmm. that had all the natural light, um, they moved all the animators out of that building and, oh, into, okay. and into a building across the street, right. known as the Hat Building, because there's a big- uh, Yes, I was there, yes. Yeah. Okay. So the Hat Building has the Mickey Sorcerer hat yeah. on there. Yeah. And uh, if uh, any of you are curious, a little bit of trivia, there is an office inside the Hat. No kidding. That used to be Roy E. Disney's hat. Uh, what office. A, that's a crazy location for- a, I got the worst vertigo in that room <laughs> Because 
the room has stripes on the walls. Oh my gosh. And they yeah, all they go converge. up, up oh. and they all converge. And I went in there and I was like, oh, I don't like that. I got to get out of here because <laughs> you don't realize like how much we rely visually on, on things that are, you know, almost all the buildings we go to and mm-hmm. places, everything is square and flat and level. And, yeah, for good reason. And mm-hmm. uh, you walk into this place of converging lines and you just, yeah. It throws your your visual equilibrium all haywire. Tim Burton knows that, and so if you watch uh, Beetlejuice and you see them in the in the uh, sort of um, afterlife offices that are all the floors are all crooked and the, it's really uh, off putting. So you can uh, also do um, another another fun thing is a, a flash zoom, and you can have uh, you know the character a flash zoom. So that means you're zooming quickly in on yes. something. Yes, and I think what we can do in this state, in this case, is um, flash zoom in, and uh, eyes, you know, big. Oh, that's great! <laughs> but that, the reflections uh, make a huge difference. You know, the yeah. Teary, tearied up almost. <laughs> Any Western film fans out there will love the flash scenes from the Sergio um, Leone uh, Italian spaghetti, the, the Western. The spaghetti Westerns, yeah. Yeah. The Good, yeah. the Bad, and the Ugly. Watch that one. Yeah, you know, those are all filmed in Spain. I didn't know that. Yeah. None of those were filmed in the Old West. How about that? Because, <laughs> I mean, they're, they were Italian filmmakers, right? So it's right they, there. It's next door. Well, not next door. You could, yeah. you could simulate the American West in Spain, apparently. Yeah, sure. That's pretty cool. So another another trick that uh, often we can use is just a little a little tilt, and you can see in the glasses. Oh, reflected. Good touch. Yes, there you go. Woo! <laughs> Life is like a hurricane. Okay. Um, we've got about a minute left and you have just pretty much nailed this. I mean, there it is. And I guess the last shot would be, would it be the a last scale shot, thing? I think, you know, what we can do. Behind, she's tiny and there's the big fat Eiffel Tower right in front. I think what we can do is, um, we can do the old snapshot cut. Okay. Tell us what so the snapshot, snapshot cut is. So snapshot cut is flash. Sometimes we'll just write flash. And then you see the photo that is taken. We'll just make that a little bit bigger. Oh, nice. Okay. We'll see the photo of, uh, you know, happy. Ah, and pointing. Yeah, there we go. Look at this. I made it. I did it, you know, and, and, uh, I found the place that I wanted to go to. It was there waiting for me the entire time, and I finally found it. There you go. And, uh, you know, there's pigeons and stuff everywhere. Always a good idea to throw some pigeons in there. You know, maybe, you know, the pigeon, you know, bombing the photo or, Ah. (laughs) you know, the clouds. And again, you want those pointing devices yes so yes. there's uh you know the you know, buildings in the city nice behind and and the, the scaffold structure it's all very simple folks but it is all so effective and this comes from years and years of experience to be able to pare things down like this and tell a clear story um, it's much easier said than done, but we've gotten a little masterclass, mini masterclass today from Mike. So I want to thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and experience with us on this. This has been so cool to watch. Um, I learned a lot and I hope everybody out there was, was paying good attention. Remember these are recorded so you can watch back and see where we started and where we've, uh, ended up. And this all just came from a little, a little chit chat. Yeah. And now we have a little mini movie. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really something, isn't it? And so... Um, I hope also this makes people appreciate the work that goes into the final products that you see when you do watch any animated feature um, or uh, TV show or anything. Yeah. That there's a lot of um, 
really great work that goes in behind the scenes at all levels, uh, starting with this vital part of the process, which is story art. Yeah. So. And story yeah. artists, uh, you, you have to be comfortable with your artwork probably never being seen by human eyes because you're you're setting the brick and mortar groundwork or the foundations of a story yeah that's going to be animated later and um you know we had a, an opportunity on on the Tuttle Twins a little while ago to uh put in some storyboard art in the credits oh that's cool and that was really nice to be able to finally you know have some people have their stuff on yeah. the screen as sort of a wrap up uh we did uh, an, an an episode where uh there were several different characters that we were Curious what happened to them afterward, you know, like uh, the Sandlot, I think, is one of the one of the famous uh, ones where you find out that, you know, this person, uh, you, you know, and his twin brother went into inventing mini malls and became rich. And you it's know, a baseball movie from I yeah. think the 90s, right? Yeah. Um, so re really, really, mm. it's a great study in character. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Squints went on to marry Wendy Peppercorn, who was the lifeguard that he was infatuated with. And they had nine kids and stuff. And. Then uh, the one kid who didn't know about baseball, mm. you know, you find out what happened to him. And the one kid who was really good at baseball. You find out what happened to him. And and uh, I'm not going to wreck the movie because spoilers <laughs> are a thing. I mean, it's a 90s movie. I guess you probably had time. But if you hadn't heard about it, then I'm, I'm not going to spoil it for you. But, um, uh, you know, it's, those artists hardly ever get their artwork on the screen. But, yeah. you know, one thing that I would like to say, though, is um, – you know, if you are an aspiring story artist, you know, you can take that aspiring part and just cut it right out. Mm. You are a story artist and be a story artist. You're at a certain level, maybe, but you don't need uh, anybody's permission to be a story artist. You right. Know? You just do it. You just do it and you make something happen. And I think that's how a lot of great things get made is people just wanting to do something and then they do it. Not asking for permission and not asking for someone else to say, this is something I will yeah. hire you to do. You just go for it. Make your own work. and mm. You don't necessarily need to seek the validation, mm. you know, because validation is great. And sometimes it'll come and sometimes it won't. But that shouldn't be the driving force behind what you do. Mm. You do art because you're passionate about art. You want you have something to say, you know, or you have something that you want to entertain by, mm. you know, we're. Is as as uh, people that are working in entertainment, you know, we are entertainers. You know, the people that make media, we're sort of the 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 court jesters of the world, right? Mm -hmm. We're we're uh, here to make ourselves silly, to to alleviate others' worries and and pain and hard times. You know, because uh, you know, one of the things a lot of people do when they've had a, a bad day is turn on the television. Yeah. Did a little get a little escapism in there. That's true, isn't it? And um, you know, when I was working on Ducktales, one of the things that uh, struck me, you know, is just when, when we went to some of those panels where the people were there and they're talking about the show. Yeah, how much those characters meant to them was yeah. staggering to me. Yeah, because when we're in the profession, we're just like, yeah, that's a character, and we're doing our thing with them, and the, you find out that it's like, you know, s somebody has really latched on and it means something to them yeah. more than what it ever meant to us. But that also means you've done a good job of, yeah. of creating characters that are relatable. There's something yeah. in a character that somebody can latch onto and say, I see a little bit of myself in that or somebody I love. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's also just part of what makes this stuff so great and timeless, really. And, and mm -hmm. that goes back into careful observation of how, you know, traits mm -hmm. that people can recognize in themselves have made it into that character yeah because either they were observed in in the person that was writing it or the person that was writing it observed someone else was like that yeah yeah so you know be an observer not yeah. a casual observer but an active observer right yeah and make sure that uh when you are out and about even that you're looking for the small idiosyncrasies that people can have because you know it's a great way to come up with good gestures that aren't just Hi. Yeah. You know, on The Simpsons, uh, our uh, supervising director, uh, Mr. Mike B. Anderson, mm. uh, would have a post it note ready sometimes with what we call the Palmy Award for people who <laughs> for had this? who had this in their storyboards way too much. Yeah. And there was, it's such a, it's such a canned it's a cliche, gesture. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a cliche. Like the, it's the old, uh, 
you know, Mickey Mouse uh, as he's presenting something to the air. Right, right, you right, know, right. Where this or, you yeah. know, oh, yeah. And, and it doesn't mean anything. Like, you yeah. could just put a waiter's tray right there and, yeah. you know, call it a day. It's not specific. Um, be specific. Be be genuine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Be, uh, you can go from generalities to specificities. I mean, Mr. Burns, just this with the yeah. <laughs> and the hunch and the, the body language. It's so... The creepiness it's of... Like, it's uh, all there. The, and, and the limpness that goes in, into <laughs> yeah. that sort of thing. And then, and then his excellent. You yeah, know, like all that, that stuff. Uh, that's, that's really great Mr. Stuff. Burns is one of my favorite to work with. Of course, with. he's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks again. Um, folks, remember, uh, we don't get a lot of opportunities to talk to folks like uh, Mike, so tell your pals and pass this one around. This is a pretty awesome um, example of what we can do in just the short span of an hour and a half talking to somebody who's working in the business. And I know a lot of you guys want to get into working professionally, whether it's in design or illustration or animation or whatever it is. Um, but these are these are great opportunities uh, to learn. So I yeah. uh, hope you will um, watch this back. And uh, when we have more in the future, always tune in. And check out yesterday's. If you missed it, we had Francois Maumont, uh, who is an incredible um artist for picture books, for illustrations, for magazines. He also worked in animation for a while um, for Cartoon Network, but um, completely different style of working, but a lot of overlap with regards to uh, creating memorable um, visual experiences for people. So, Merci à tout le monde pour nous joindre pour aujourd'hui et à la prochaine. Uh, bisous et ciao for now. Bye.